there's real escalation and there's fabricated escalation. And you've got to, you know, to be a construction manager and service your clients, you need to weed through this information and not just accept it as fact and really dig to the bottom of it. As the owners that listen to this, I mean, one of the things they definitely need to do is be diligent with their construction managers or their general contractor if it's a bid project. Just because you see a headline that says 25% tariff on imported steel and you get a bill that's, you know, jacking your price 10%, just don't take that for for gospel and really dig into it and get the backup that justifies that increase. This episode brought to you by Suites at Madison. Meeting in conference rooms for rent by the hour, week, month, or year. Suites at Madison, where business gets done. Check them out at www.downtowntampaoffice.com. Now, on to the show. You are listening to the Invest Florida Real Estate Show, covering topics in lending, buy and sell strategies, property management, hot markets, and tips and tools to guide you along the way on your path to real estate success. You want Florida Investment Real Estate Talk? You have come to the right place. And now, our hosts, Eric Odom and Stephen Silverman. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Invest Florida Real Estate Show. This is your co-host, Eric Odom, flying solo today. Stephen had to take care of an emergency, but we've got a great guest today. I know that some of... You guys that own single family and some of the smaller apartment owners are going to think this doesn't apply to you, but trust me, it does. Construction pricing, construction timeframes and getting stuff done have escalated considerably. And we've got a guy who's going to talk to us about that. What are some of the drivers in this market and what are some of the things we have to be concerned about? So I don't care whether you're turning an apartment building for the next renter or you're building a retail center or an apartment building downtown Tampa. It doesn't really matter what you're doing. You kind of need to know what's going on with the market because what you paid in construction prices two years ago, the time frame it took you to get a deal done, a, a project complete, is considerably more today. And our speaker is going to talk about that. He's going to talk about some of the factors that were driving that. We've been answering questions, uh, man, because, you know, we, we manage retail properties and it's been a struggle with our owners to understand, look, guys, um, we've had some changes in the market. It's harder to get guys and keep them on the job. Uh, there's just so much pressure. Um, and, and then there's been some governmental things that have gone on. So I know you're going to get a lot out of it just because you're not developing a 50 story apartment building. You need to understand what's happening here because it is going to affect not only the availability of skilled workers, but also materials and supplies. And it's going to roll downhill. It's going to be it cause increasing in, in pricing of, of rents and whatnot as some of these things flow into the market. Wanted to take a little moment here to call out Dan Thompson from Sarasota. Dan is a listener to the show. And he says that he enjoys the podcast. You guys do a great job bringing on a wide variety of investors in all types of properties. Thanks again for the efforts. Dan, we really appreciate the time that you took to send us a little note and keep us informed of how, what you feel about the show. Uh, we read all the good ones, the bad ones uh, we uh, pay attention to also because it does affect us in terms of how we decide to, particularly with constructive criticism, some of the uh, non-constructive criticism we just delete. But regardless, it does get read. Everything that you guys uh, tell us, we try to take under advisement and figure out how we can affect the show, make it better for you. At the end of the day, it needs to work for you uh, or it doesn't work for anybody. Uh, we appreciate you guys uh, – Coming on and, and, and leaving comments and spending half an hour, an hour with us uh, every other week, twice a month and talking about real estate related issues. I think that's all I've got right now. It's all that I had in my notes. I was supposed to cover again. I'm flying solo. Steven's not with us today, but uh, we'll be back with us next week. He had a little bit of emergency he had to deal with. So guys, let's go ahead and roll with our guest. And today we have with us Frank Regal. Frank is the Vice President General Manager of Wallbridge's Florida Division. A graduate from East Carolina University, Mr. Regal has managed the construction of numerous large commercial projects throughout the state. His construction experience is diverse, including educational facilities, corporate commercial buildings, hospitals, aviation, and high-rise construction projects. 
Frank is well known in the industry, recognized nationally as one of the top 40 under 40 in Building and Design Plus Construction Magazine 2012, top 20 under 40 in the Southeast by Engineering News Record 2011, and one of the Tampa Bay Business Journal's 2012 up and comers. He is a graduate of Leadership Florida, Connect Florida, Leadership Tampa Bay, and Leadership Pasco. Frank, Thanks so much for joining us on the Invest Florida Show. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me. So why don't we start by you giving our listeners a 30,000-foot view of Wallbridge and what they do, where they are in the construction business? Sure. Absolutely. So Wallbridge, we're a... Uh, 100-year-old company. We're $1.5 billion in annual revenue based out of Detroit, Michigan. We're uh, U.S.-based and employee-owned. You know, for a company of our size, that's uh, that's kind of a rarity. We've been in Florida for 30 years. We came down through an acquisition of a company called Darren and Armstrong, and we're involved in the uh, ball at Epcot. And uh, we've had offices in uh, Tampa and Orlando uh, ever since. We're basically uh, throughout the mid- Midwest and uh, international we have offices in Pittsburgh. Charlotte would be the closest office to us here in Tampa. You know, operate through the U.S. and internationally. Now, it doesn't matter whether our listeners, whether they're fixing houses or building apartment complexes or large developments around the state, it keeps coming up concerns about the construction industry and where, where we are. Why don't we cover, I mean, I know you and I were talking before we started recording today about some of the major points, but what are some of the biggest sort of things that are happening right now that are causing some pressure on pricing in the market? Well, I mean, we're in a hot market right now. I mean, there's a lot of work out there. Skilled trades workers, you know, people in the field that can actually perform the work. That's always been a challenge. And when you have a hot market like this, that uh, only increases that pressure. So that's something that, you know, we definitely need to keep an eye on and make sure that we have the skilled trades people to deliver the work that we're engaged in. And the other thing is, you know, material escalation. You know, there's both, you know, some of it real related to tariffs and other items that put pressure on the material suppliers. Some of it's not, and we've got to weed through that information and make sure that we're getting the best value for our clients. Let, let's talk specifically about some of, well, there's, I mean, these are the three, the, the big use that we talked about earlier, the, the skilled trade workers. And it's interesting. I continue to have conversations with my nieces and nephews and my friends, kids uh, that are at that age of trying to make a decision. And, you know, so much of my comment is like, go in the trades. There's a massive demand and there's a shortage. There is, there is, and a lot of opportunity. For some reason, they don't, they don't want to do this, Frank. I mean, what, what do you see as some of the issues that are, and, and, and what are you doing to sort of correct some of these issues with the, you know, the number of skilled trade workers out there? So, you know, I'm, a, I'm involved on a, a couple different fronts. And, uh, you know, one thing I would say, um, definitely there's a stigma that was created where um, you feel at the high school level that you have to go to college. And so, you know, coming out into the trades as lucrative as it is, um, you know, where you could, you know, really, really uh, get trained as a plumber and electrician and by your, your 30s um, have a substantial career and the experience to back it up. There's a feeling that, you know, you need to go to school. So one of uh, the things I'm involved with, I'm on the board of the Associated Builders and Contractors. A couple years ago, we started a foundation called Build Tampa Bay. We do a uh, um, annual event where we bring in, we bus in all the high school students and just do a trade show about the trades and the opportunities that exist. And, and a lot of them don't realize, you know, with shop and all the other things that have really been taken out of high school programs, that those opportunities exist and, and are as lucrative as they are, um, especially as like a welder, an electrician, a plumber. Also, I chaired the uh, foundation at Pasco Hernando State College, still involved in that foundation. We've actually started programs up there at PHSC that train in the trade. So there's a welding program up there. We're looking at HVAC and electrical. And again, saying, you know, okay, you're, you're not going to combat that stigma that, hey, I have to go to college out of high school. So we're trying to embrace it and create opportunities out of that to bring people into the trades. And so, Frank, how are they reacting 
it seems like almost from birth, from the time they start kindergarten and the education process begins, it's there's almost an indoctrination that you have to go to college if you're going to be successful, and that's just utter nonsense. But are are, yeah. are, are they yeah. receptive when you go out there and press the flesh with them that, wow, I didn't know about that, that would be a path? Or do you think they sort of go, well, I, I, I still want to go to college? Or what, what do you, What's the general feedback that you're getting from, from uh, kids that are perhaps considering construction? No, I think we're getting a, a great feedback. The welding program up at uh, PHSC, um, that program is is repeatedly full. You know, all all of the uh, the kids that come out of that program with a, a certificate land very uh, very lucrative jobs. That's definitely a success story. Build Tampa Bay is as well. Um, you know, we bring in you know guest speakers and just talk about the industry as a whole. And I think it's eye opening for the people that are involved in it to see that you know hey here's something where you know. I'm not going to sit in a cubicle all day long. One of the beauties of construction is, you know, I've been doing this over 20 years. I don't think I've ever done the same thing twice. You know, there's always new challenges. You're you're always up out of your seat and, and dealing with those challenges and those problems. So it it very much is exciting for young people that see what they can do in this industry. And, uh, you know, I think it's attractive. We just need that platform to, to show them. And so once we show them with Build Tampa Bay and those items uh, or things like that, I think uh, I think we see a lot of success where they're definitely interested in getting into apprenticeship programs and uh, starting to build a, a career. I don't think people realize the sinkhole of devastation that occurred in 2008 because we lost such a massive portion of our construction workers that either left the state altogether or changed industry. And so really yeah, those guys, yeah. this 10 years ago, these guys that were 27, 28, 29 years old now should be pulling the wagon on the construction industry. And we lost so many of them. So it's, I know you're having to work double time to try to, uh, to catch up. And then when we had this, the market bounced back, there just wasn't the resources, the human resources to pull the wagon. And I'm glad to see you guys out there, you know, trying to address that and actually getting in the streets rather than just wringing your hands about it. Cause it is a real problem. It's a big problem. You need to you need to get in front of it, just like any problem. Uh, you got to get in front of it, and and again, those are, those items are you know ways to do that. Um, we definitely see a uh, a shortage in the the mid level talent. Um, you know, as far as you know, both as general contractors, construction managers, and the subcontractors, and I, I think it is all related to that that recession. Um, you know, the ones we did lose uh, regionally, and we also lost them to different industries. But there's young talent coming into the market. Now, which is good. Um, there's definitely the seasoned professionals, but that that mid level talent is uh, is hard to find. Mm -hmm. So let's talk, let's change topics a little bit here. Just another one of the issues that you're facing: specific commodities. Are there any specific commodities that are more problematic than others? Is it concrete? Is it steel? Is it you know? Is it rebar? Is it aluminum? What are some of the the items that you're looking at and going, wow, that's those are made really big advances in price. And we're concerned about where they are right now or where they're headed to. Well, there's, um, you know, definitely, I mean, you, you talk about steel and, and the tariffs um, that came out. You know, one thing we're always combating in this industry is, I mean, there, there's there's real escalation and there's fabricated escalation. And you've got to, you know, to be a construction manager and service your clients, you need to weed through this information and not just accept it as fact and really dig to the bottom of it. You know, with the steel tariffs, there's, a, you know, 25% on imported steel, I think, 10% on aluminum. Now, is that already in place or is that is that something that's coming, Frank? So, well, that was a proclamation that came out in March. And okay. so the end of March, that actually went into effect. But there's exemptions to that. So, you know, right now, as I understand it, Mexico and Canada are exempt um, from the materials coming out of that. You know, and then there, there are suppliers in the U.S. that can get exemptions. So we just need to dig through that information. I mean, suppliers are going to use that. I don't want to say as an excuse, but, you know, this kind of information gets out. It gets headlines and prices really start to climb up. And we just just need to be able to justify that pricing before we pass it on to our clients. The other thing is, you know, it's a resource issue as far as inventory. So you stop importing steel by way of tariff. It, your domestic steel, it, it just can't keep up with the demand. So, you know, really, when you look at a building, there's there's the 
three big things that go into it are concrete, metal, and glass. Um, and it seems like one of the three is always some kind of major escalation uh, trend. Right now, we're dealing with the steel. You know, we are seeing some impact there. Tell me kind of what you've seen from, you say you're dealing with an impact. Like, what have you seen, generally speaking, in terms of the impact on the pricing in steel? So, you know, we're right now we're looking at, I mean, and, and there's different steel components. So when you look at steel, I mean, you're, you've got your structural beams, your tubing, you know, your rebar and re-steel and that kind of stuff. And, you know, we're seeing four to five percent there across the board. I mean, that's, that's, you know, material and insulation. But, um, also, you know, you've got to look at conduit and, uh, metal studs and other steel products that are going to start to see the effects of this as well, um, on the backside. Um, you know, the aluminum, I mean, roll up doors on buildings as far as garage doors and those type of items, you know, they're starting to see an effect as well. So you've got to pay attention to your quotes. You've got to pay attention to your contracts with your owners um, and just make everybody aware of the situation we're in. One thing you don't want to do is just totally wash your hands of the problem and put it all on the submarket because then, you know, your subcontractor pricing is including contingencies to deal with these items. You want to getting in the forefront and sharing the risk so that you can get your prices more to a real level of what's actually happening. We're not, just because somebody comes in the door and says, hey, you know, there's a 25% tariff, here's my new price. Well, that's great, but show us the original quote, show us what you're paying for the material now, and let's do our due diligence and dig into this and really find out, you know, what the true impact is, as opposed to just a reactionary impact where people are... uh looking at the headlines and just throwing a number at it. I know it's difficult because each project is going to be project specific, but generally speaking, have you seen, you know, the complete cost? I'm, so just factoring steel, let's just talk about steel. Sure. Have you seen maybe a one or 2% increase in what you're bidding as a result, or is it too hard really for you to try to quantify how much of that's, been flowing through because as you say it's not always just the the i beams it's the the doors it's the conduit there's other things that are going in there so i'm just curious if you sort of done an analysis and said okay well we've seen this five four to five percent increase in the price of steel therefore it's flowing through at a one percent increase in our overall average construction prices or anything like that that you'd be able to sort of share it would depend. Um, so like on structural steel, something that's totally affected. Um, yes, we're definitely seeing a uh, increase in pricing. That's something that we have a, uh, a forecast report that we put out once a month that just kind of gives us an idea. Um, you know, of those different impacts. Um, it can be, it can be one to two percent across the board. Um, where, where you come into issues is like, say, a lump sum job. Um, we've got a big job, uh, out in the Orlando market right now that was bid as a lump sum. And we're starting to see the, the tariff impact, um, coming through again, real versus, you know, fabricated, and we're weeding through that right now. But you got to buy your jobs early. You got to understand what's happening in the market so you can secure these deals again, because what we're doing as a service, a client service manager, I mean, we, we don't want to pass this on to our owners unless we absolutely have to. Um, but, you know, again, there's a, it's a double-edged sword. You don't want to get too risk adverse where you're, you know, again, putting it on the subcontract market, because then if they've got to carry escalation for 90 days, especially with the uncertainty of everything that's going on, um, you know, there's definitely going to be a markup in that that contingency that they carry in their numbers. So um, we, we've seen the, uh, as far as people holding their pricing, you know, whereas, you know, 30 days was kind of a norm and you could usually stretch it out. Um, we're talking to, especially on big jobs like that, the electrician, the steel guy daily. I mean, we're talking to the garage door guy um, just for the fact that we want to mitigate that and and buy that job in a way that we don't have those impacts. Yeah, hold, holding the bag at the end of the day. I mean, it's not like people yeah. think contractors, oh, they make 35%. It doesn't, they go 5%, who cares? They still make a lot of money. This is not the way it works. <laughs> I mean, your margins are pretty are pretty uh, skinny. And they are. Percent here, they are. here and there, I mean, can really, really be the difference between being able to make a profit and, and losing your shirt. 
And I don't think people understand yeah. that. They just yeah. think that, oh, well, I'm paying this contractor $1.4 million to build that. He's got he make four five hundred thousand dollars profit. That's not the way it works. Construction margins are pretty well, it, it depends on your, your contract environment too. I mean, one of the things we definitely prefer is construction management where, you know, we, we were fee based and we agree to a fee with an owner and everything's open book and we become their advocate and we, we show them and we help them weed through those decisions and, you know, where it makes sense to take risk and where it's, uh, where it makes sense to put it back on the market. Um, with, you know, we do bid jobs, um, but even when we bid a job, we take it with that construction manager approach. Mm-hmm. Again, we want to service our clients and make sure that, um, you know, we're not just passing these things along. And I think, you know, as the owners that listen to this, I mean, one of the things they definitely need to do is be diligent with their construction managers or their general contractor if it's a bid project. Just because you see a headline that says 25% tariff on imported steel and you get a bill that's, you know, jacking your price 10%, just don't take that for for gospel and really dig into it and get the backup that justifies that increase. We've talked a lot about steel. Are, is there any other raw material issue that's – is it, or is it pretty much across the board? Is there anything else that's sort of outstanding that you guys have your eye on right now you're concerned about? Steel is the word of the day, but like I said, the big three tend to, tend to shift. You know, I remember uh, – Several years back when I came into this market, they were renovating a baseball stadium, uh, building a hockey stadium, and building a brand-new football stadium all around the same time, and, and that put a tremendous stress on masonry and concrete. So, you know, that that's more locally um, – market driven and there is a lot of work in the Tampa Bay area right now in Orlando which both areas we have offices and so we're keeping an eye on that work um just for the fact that we know that it's going to suck up resources we know it's going to suck up uh material and so we've got to keep an eye on that and make sure that the projects that we're currently helping our owners budget and plan that we've got an adequate uh projection of where we're going to be and uh making sure that we can achieve their goals and not be impacted by that. You mentioned a forecast report. Is that an internal report at your company, or is that something you can share with us? It is. It is. I mean, we we just, uh, we have um, part of our procurement department, um, they, they, produce um, with our estimating team and our pre-construction just a, a, a basically a monthly snapshot and we track um, what we look at uh, as materials that are kind of on the rise and where we don't see change um, you know right now the, the ones in the red are definitely uh, metal lumber is also we're seeing about a one percent uh, 1.7 percent if you want to get exact um, on, on lumber um, as far as pricing going up um, the conduit, uh, EMT, you know, that kind of stuff hasn't been affected yet in our report, but we're starting to hear the word from the subcontractors that, again, this is starting to trickulate down to them as well. Mm-hmm. So metal is definitely what we've got our eye on. Concrete masonry, again, that's uh, that's something that I think is going to be more um, market-driven, at least in these areas, as far as when this workload starts to pick up, that's something that we're definitely going to have to uh Keep our eye on. That's a big driver. Construction is like real estate in regard that there are local effects to pricing and timing of when Mm -hmm. you get your projects done. You know, I sit in my office, I look out the window, and I'm looking at a couple billion dollars worth of proposed construction just in, in Tampa Bay. You know, I look at uh, Emily Arena. I mean, obviously, there's the Water Street Project with Vinick um, and SPP. I mean, there's a ton of work there. Um, you've got Larry Feldman that you kind of come up along the corner, and he's got a 55-story uh, um, uh, building proposed there. And then you keep going up the river walk, and you're in uh, the Heights, and you've got Soho Capital up there that's got uh, a bunch of plans. So, um, you and know, frame, all that frameworks, work happens Yeah, frameworks and their pro- apartment projects, and they've had this stuff over on yeah. Harbor Island. And, I mean, it's just been on and on and on. And this stuff doesn't happen in a vacuum. There's only so many. We talk about the skilled trade workers. We're already short of them. So you've got these massive projects. And of course, Water Street, the Vinick Project in uh, South Downtown, that's the 800-pound gorilla. But these, it's not like these other large projects happen – without any effect on the market. And when you st- they become the effect becomes cumulative. You've already got pressure on resources. Absolutely. And and now you're really just putting gasoline on, on the fire. So Vinick just got cranked up this month, this past month. 
What, what's your yeah, feeling yeah. about what's happening with the Water Street project in South Downtown and what that's going to do for the timing of deals in our market and pricing and whatnot? What's, do you have any kind of feel for that yet, Frank? I can tell you, I'll give them a bunch of credit and the fact that uh, they've been able to get the uh, road work done without uh, affecting my uh, commute to the playoff games, which is okay. fantastic. <laughs> but um, there's, um, there's, uh, yeah, I mean, that work is starting to go. And, you know, I mean, that is, that's the stuff that grabs the headlines, but uh, you can't forget about, you know, we're still building schools and we're still doing work in higher ed and uh, we've got industrial projects that we're working on now. So there's all these other clients that have these needs and although they're projects might not be, you know, something that gets on the front page of the paper. Um, they're every bit as, as valuable to the community. And so we need to, again, look at those resources and look at that flow and make sure that when we're working with, uh, say, Pasco County Schools or Hillsborough County Schools on a proposed project, that we understand where they fit in the mix of what's going on with these other projects. We understand where the resources are. Um, you know, the Water Street project is going to be phased from what I understand and what I see, which is a good thing. Um, you obviously don't want it all happening at once because that would be a major resource drain. Um, you know, USF Health is going up now. Um, I think the hotel is something on the backside. Um, but they've got a uh, program manager now that's come in, a construction manager that's running the whole show for them. Um, and I, I think, uh, you know, that that's good that it's coordinated and it'll just be interesting to see how it's phased out and and making sure that those pieces um, don't affect some of the other things that are going on. And Frank, you operate the I-4 corridor from Tampa to Orlando. What's happening in Orlando? Is there anything equivalent to the Water Street Project that is sucking resources and causing a strain on the system there? Well, I think um, if you look at downtown Orlando, um, you've got the Magic, which is, they're doing a, a, a uh, multi, uh, multi-use, um, development, uh, adjacent to their arena there. And then you've got, uh, UCF, which is working on a downtown campus. So those are definitely both, um, two major projects. Um, you know, maybe they're a year behind, uh, SPP, but, uh, the same kind of growth is, is happening, uh, funny coincidentally around another arena you know that growth will definitely uh, affect resources we um we're doing a major terminal right now out at uh, orlando sanford airport and so we're going to be out there for about two and a half years on a 60 million dollar project and again by early um so we're procuring all, all our deals and getting everything lined up we're not going to leave anything to chance so that that project is set up so that it can execute per original plan but as those other things happen yeah, I mean, when you're working for, say, Orange County Schools or the other the other entities out there that, again, aren't grabbing the headlines, the kind of things that people forget about, um, we've got to make sure that we can deliver those product, products while the other jobs are going on as well. And it's, you know, one one thing, you know, where the, the rest of the comp- country might have a advantage where you can suck resources from other areas. We don't really have that advantage of Florida. I mean, it's not like anybody's going to get in their car in Miami and drive up to Tampa to do a project yeah. because Miami is just as hot as as Tampa and Orlando. So, um, so we just again we've got to keep our eye on all of it and just be realistic in our planning and communicate to our owners so we understand what we're up against. It's interesting you talk about transient talent, the transient skilled workers, and obviously Miami's hot, Orlando's hot, Tampa's hot, Jacksonville's hot. Everybody, all the markets in 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 Florida hot, and nobody's hurting. But there are still disruptors. I think you would agree with me here in the market, particularly during the storm season, because when you get a major catastrophe that occurs, it seems as though some of the insurance companies and, and, and folks that are obligated to get buildings restored, to get tenants back in them, will frequently pay significantly higher rates to draw skilled mm-hmm. workers out of particular areas. And we've certainly seen on some of, I know because it got it affected us last year on one of our tenant improvement build outs where all of a sudden it's like, oh, well, the absolutely. subs aren't here today. <laughs> Why? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, well, I mean, you know, I, I think, you know, we, we, we definitely have an advantage um, being a hundred year old company and having the size that we are. Um, we're, we're a steady ship that's been here a long time and we're going to, we're going to keep on going. And so there's, you know, we have relationships with subs and, and vendors 
competitors in the marketplace where um, they definitely don't want to upset those relationships and they want to keep it going because it's more of a long term play than just uh, you know an immediate uh, uh, potential Quick, yeah, hit on your yeah. profit. But then you know yeah. you're not going to chase hurricanes for forever. So, yeah. <laughs> so, but there's a mix. I mean, there's, there's people that will definitely jump, jump ship. We just need to have our resource pool large enough where we can backfill um, when those things happen and hopefully mitigate uh, any potential impacts. You've given us a really great overview on sort of what's happening in the, in the market. If folks want to get in touch with you, how would they go about doing that? Frank, they got a project they want to, uh, they want to talk to you about. How would they do that? Well, they could definitely uh, visit our webpage, uh, Walbridge. Um, feel free to call. Um, uh, you know, I would. Not, you can publish my email address. Um, I'd be happy to talk to anybody about their uh, individual needs and uh, you know their projects and uh, see if uh, see if our resources uh, match their needs and see if we can be a be a help. And you know, we have a lot of listeners that will own single family homes, and we've talked about a lot of really large projects. I should have given a caveat before we started for the folks that think that doesn't apply to them. They're going to learn about this the hard way. As you get yeah. demand in the market, I don't care who you are. If you're in a real estate investor, it's going to affect you. And that means. Well, I think, you know, I think the smaller and, and, and I don't mean that in a negative way, but the, the smaller buyer you are, the more of an impact you're of going course. to see. You have less if you're buying, buying power. one garage door. You know, I, I say I'm buying a, a hundred roll up doors, you know, in a given year and you're buying one or two or four, you know, you, I think you're going to see more of an impact on the aluminum escalation than, you know, somebody that's spreading it a, across multiple jobs. Exactly. And we talked about the guys chasing hurricanes. That's a real issue for the single family home flippers because, or even the small apartment owners, they have to turn an apartment. They need to do some work to get that, uh, that apartment or that house ready to go. And they're relying on skilled labor to do that. But they're only giving those jobs to those guys once or twice a month. Those are the first ones to go hop yeah. in their truck and drive down to Fort Myers when a storm goes rolling through there. They don't care. You're not enough. Your buying power is not enough to keep those guys captive where someone like, you know, a wall bridge or a larger construction firm has these cemented relationships with subs that they're afraid of losing your business because that's their bread and butter. So it, well, it's a long-term play. Exactly. Yeah. And you know, when I go home, I'm not exempt from being a homeowner. So <laughs> I've lived through a right. couple of renovations and I'm living through one right now. And I can tell you that all, all the pain that you're talking about, uh, I've definitely, uh, I've definitely experienced from the other end as well. Yeah. And, and again, it's, it's buying power. I mean, it's, 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 it's a standard commerce. I mean, it's, you know, the bigger buying power and the better your relationships and the longer you've been here, um, treating people right and treating them fairly and having a reputation of doing that. Um, you know, those, those are the kind of things that pay dividends when times are tough. I hear you, Frank, really appreciate the time that you spent with us today. Is there anything else you'd like to, any other thoughts you'd like to leave us with before we let you go? No, I really appreciate your time. And again, uh, you know, wallbridge.com and feel free to reach out to me via email. Anybody that's listening, I'd be happy to answer your questions. And, uh, it's an exciting time and it's a, it's a fun industry to be in. And, uh, I think we're going to start to see the young people come our way. Um, and uh, again, I hope this, uh, keeps going because it's a, it's a great time to be in construction. Terrific, Frank. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time. Thank you. And that was Frank Regal from Wallbridge Construction talking to us about some of the issues that are affecting the pricing and time frames of getting construction work done in the Central Florida market. A lot of pressure, lots of projects going on both in Orlando and in Tampa, all up and down the I-4 corridor. That's putting strain on resources, not just steel, but also skilled trade workers. As always, guys, we appreciate the time that you invest with us each and every week. If you want to hear other great speakers like Frank, you can go to www.investfloridashow.com. We appreciate the comments that you give us because it helps us understand more what to talk about in each one of the shows. We also love the reviews. So, guys, as always, until next time, hasta la vista. You've just listened to the Invest Florida podcast with Eric Odom and Stephen Silverman. Join us every week for actionable real estate investment ideas. And of course, visit our website at www.investfloridashow.com 
for more shows and tips on how to earn a cash flow in the real estate market in Florida. While hosts and producers of the Invest Florida show have no reason to doubt the validity of comments of our guests, we do not warranty their accuracy. Please check with your legal, financial, and tax advisors before entering into any investment. Returns will vary from person to person and deal to deal based on unique circumstances. All information expressed in this show is for educational purposes only. Opinions of the guests are not necessarily shared by the hosts and producers of the Invest Florida Show.